the air with former President Trump touching down in New York in just the last hour ahead of a moment that will make history less than 24 hours from now. The new details on what we expect to hear at his arraignment, the city bracing for protests, and Mr. Trump adding some new muscle to his legal team. We're live on the ground with what you need to know before he heads to court tomorrow. We're also live in Arkansas, a state getting ready for round two of big storms, even as it's just starting to soar through what's left from the last storms, deadly tornadoes that killed dozens of people. Plus, new tonight, police in Nashville say the shooter who killed three kids and three adults at an elementary school had planned to commit mass murder. What else we're learning from their manifesto? And how a deadly drug-resistant bacteria infecting people initially from contaminated eye drops is now spreading even further. Why experts say this is getting to be such a concern. And in tonight's original, four astronauts have just learned they're going to go farther than any humans have ever gone into space. How NASA is now using AI to help them orbit the moon. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and former President Trump, he is now at Trump Tower, rolling up in just the last hour, ahead of a day that will make history, when he'll become the first former president indicted for a crime. We're learning more tonight about how things are going to go down tomorrow. Here's what we know, that sometime mid-afternoon, Mr. Trump is going to show up at a Manhattan courthouse, presumably with the new lawyer he just hired. More on that in a minute. He's going to get fingerprinted. He's not going to get DNA taken, we don't think. And we don't know yet about a mugshot. Even if he did, that's supposed to stay stay secret. We'll see. At that point, we should know more about the specifics here, right? What exactly is in this indictment? Our sources say he's facing something like 30 fraud-related charges connected to alleged money payments to former adult film star Stormy Daniels. The details will matter. We should get them tomorrow after the arraignment. Donald Trump turns around. He flies back home to Mar-a-Lago, where he's set to speak at 8.15 Eastern tomorrow night. We're going to have special coverage here. And I'm sure you saw it, right? This, the moment that he got back to his Manhattan apartment. It's a quick shot, a quick wave. He heads in the doors. He's waving to demonstrators who showed up outside about an hour after his eponymous plane touched down at LaGuardia in New York. And if you see it here, you probably saw it everywhere, right? Plastered across cable news, live, in the air, on the air, a sign of just how much of a scene this is. Even Mr. Trump's son, Eric, tweeted that his dad was watching his own plane's takeoff live on cable news. And yes, it's a scene, but it is also history, right? That's why it's getting covered because this is a historic moment. And it's history that the former president clearly doesn't like. He's posting online that this country's gone to hell. He's arguing to move the trial out of Manhattan, that's a long shot, or to remove the borough's district attorney, Alvin Bragg, that's a non-starter. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is a Trump ally, is set to host a demonstration tomorrow in New York. And tonight, the city is ready for any other protests, with the mayor there saying there's no specific threat, but he does have a warning. Listen. While there may be some rabble rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, our message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. We're going to get the legal breakdown from Laura Jarrett in a second, but I want to start on the ground with Dasha Burns, who is outside Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan. What are you seeing on the ground right now, Dasha? Well, Hallie, that moment that you talked about when Trump uh, waved to some folks as he got inside of Trump Tower, here where we were standing, it was quite a moment. Look, there were a lot of folks here. This is Midtown Manhattan. For those of you that don't live in New York, this is an area that sees a lot of tourist traffic. Normally, people are here shopping, going to the Lego store. Today, though, throughout the day leading up to that moment you played there, Hallie, people were coming up to us asking, where is the former president? What are we expecting today? When is he going to be at Trump Tower? And as he made his way here to Midtown, people started pulling out their phones just about everyone on their street had their phones out recording documenting the moment we saw helicopters uh, NYPD choppers overhead a massive crowd gathered just across the street from Trump Tower this was uh, a, a lot of commotion here no pro major protests though Hallie it's been fairly quiet on that front today you heard from the mayor warning folks though about tomorrow to uh, to control themselves to behave themselves none of those issues so far here today, Hallie. One of the things that we talk about, Dasha, right, because this is a moment that's making history, the Trump team doesn't want to see it make history, like, on TV, on camera, in court. They've got this new legal filing out asking the judge to basically prevent cameras from being in the courtroom. They don't want what they describe as a circus-like atmosphere. They don't want to interfere with what they call Mr. Trump's presumption of innocence here. Um, 
Set some expectations for us then ahead of tomorrow and what we might actually see like on TV here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we're going to get much more than what we got today. We might see a glimpse of him as he moves uh, from the area where he'll get processed. You know, that, that fingerprinting process, the paperwork, and uh, escorted to the courtroom. We might see maybe five seconds of him in that moment there, perhaps as he's exiting Trump Tower. But we are not going to get to see a whole lot of those proceedings as far as we know. Again, all of this with the caveat that anything could change at any moment. There are petitions including from NBC News to allow cameras in the courtroom uh, to also unseal that indictment as soon as possible. But as of now, a lot of what we're talking about here is going to happen behind closed doors, Howley. There's also, you know, this sense that the Donald Trump campaign is trying to make the most, if you will, off of this, that at least in the short term, this is actually helping them mobilize support. I've talked to sources who say, hey, long term, it could be a different story. But at least right now, they're raising a ton of money off this indictment. It's growing by the millions almost every day. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've seen emails come through from his campaign with indictment swag, Hallie. This is definitely a moment that they are trying to capitalize off of. And when you talk to Republican voters, that's working right now. Again, emphasis on right now. Uh, they are rallying around him. A lot of folks saying that this is unfair. You've seen even his opponents in the primary of businessman Vivek Ramaswamy today actually launched an ad uh, calling for all Republicans to uh, condemn the indictment and to rally around the former president. What that means long term in this presidential campaign, what it means for the general election if he is in fact the nominee, that's where the question mark comes because that's a very different audience he's talking to. But for the primary and for the coming months, he's going to get all the attention. He's going to suck all the oxygen out of, uh, out of the air here. And he's uh, going to be able to capitalize off of this uh, according to those numbers, the, the millions of dollars that he's already raised, Hallie. Yeah, more than $7 million as of tonight so far. Dasha Burns, thank you. Laura Jarrett. I want to bring you in here for some of the legal breakdown here. And we're just learning about this new member of the Donald Trump legal team, a guy named mm -hmm. Todd Blanche. He knows New York. He was a Manhattan, um, a federal prosecutor in Manhattan for a number of years. He represented Paul Manafort, a former Trump ally, Trump aide on state fraud charges. What does it say to you that this guy is coming on board now, Laura? It shows that they're taking it seriously, Hallie. The, mm. the timing of it, obviously, uh, pretty down to the wire here, given that he's going in for his arraignment tomorrow. Um, but on the other hand, given all the public posturing of them not being worried about this case and dismissing it as political, adding a new member of the team with somebody who's experienced, someone who's a former prosecutor, I think sort of speaks for itself. And given Blanche's background, as you mentioned, representing Manafort, in what? A case involving the falsification of business records. That's what Manafort Manafort was facing uh, falsification of business records in order to get loans. That was the allegation by prosecutors. Now, that case eventually went away, but it is worth noting the similarity potentially if, in fact, that is what Trump is facing. And our reporting has suggested that the yeah. falsification of business records could be key here, that it's just interesting that it's the exact same charge. And that's why it's going to be so important to actually get our hands on this indictment yes. once it comes out, presumably tomorrow. Your latest reporting also indicates that there is a risk for Donald Trump if he keeps talking about not just the case, but about specifically the judge here. And there's this question of a gag order, which I find so interesting. The judge could put a gag order in place, but this is not just your regular person showing up for an arraignment, Laura. This is an active, current presidential candidate. To say nothing of his time already in the White House, this is somebody right. who is running for office. And there, I imagine, is a free speech case that could potentially be made here, too. Talk us through that. A hundred percent. Even, you know, all defendants, even those who are not former presidents, who are not running sure. for office, have free speech concerns. And judges are typically uh, loath to impose gag orders, especially complete ones, which would cover attorneys, witnesses, the defendant themselves. They're loath to do it. It's known as a prior restraint. The Supreme Court frowns upon it unless there's really a serious need to do it. And in this case, I'm told Mershon is unlikely to do it, but he may issue a warning, essentially telling Trump he's at his own risk if he does this. There's, to be clear on some of the, the legal intricacies here, right, there's this case that we're talking about that is going to be so much um, of the focus tomorrow. No. Legal experts that I think you've talked to, certainly that I've talked to, have said of all the cases that Donald Trump faces, this may be the, I don't want to say least significant, but um, 
uh, uh, perhaps of least concern to Donald Trump. He is framing this as politically motivated. There are other cases that he faces too, other investigations, one that's ramping up in Georgia, where a source is telling one of our colleagues, Blaine Alexander, that the DA's office is watching how things unfold in Manhattan. Two separate cases, but they're keeping an eye on it. There's also the special counsel investigations into January 6th and classified documents. Where should we expect these other cases to go, and how much is that going to be a part of the conversation over the next 24 hours here? Well, I think the thing to watch is what's going on with Jack Smith. Obviously, it's a federal investigation. It's quite serious. The special the counsel there, right. The president, of course, maintains that he has done nothing wrong, but you see the Washington Post now reporting uh, fresh evidence that prosecutors have of his potential involvement in the obstruction, uh, in the issue uh, of withholding, um, or rather, retaining classified information and then stopping investigators from retrieving it. So I think that's one to watch in particular. Uh, and also, Smith is has his eyes set on getting the testimony of the former vice president, Mike Pence. That's another one to watch there, as obviously Pence could provide critical testimony about Trump's yeah. efforts to cling to power. So I think those are ones obviously worth watching. But we have to see what's in tomorrow's indictment. We can't know until we see it. That's the thing. Laura, we'll be waiting on pins and needles with you. Thank you so much. Big day ahead, I know. We're just hours away, by the way, from another big development down south. Another storm pounding almost the exact same area that just got decimated by deadly tornadoes. 35 million people right now at risk of yet another round of twisters and hail and more. Look at this map. It's almost identical to the one we saw last week with these two really risky areas here near Little Rock, you see, and then up near Peoria. But this time, the prediction is for the potential of multiple rounds of storms, not just one big round like last week. That is what led to scenes like this. Neighborhoods just flattened, right? Just decimated here in what turned out to be a series of deadly storms, 32 people killed when more than 50 confirmed tornadoes swept through 15 states, even states like New Jersey and Delaware that don't often see this kind of thing. In Delaware, one person died. That's the state's first tornado death in 40 years. Emily Aketa is in Little Rock, Arkansas for us. And Emily, I can't even bear to think about the people who are dealing with what I see behind you in this live shot here, who are now bracing for maybe another round of storms on the way. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. Right now, they are salvaging anything they can as quickly as they can. And you can see just how daunting of a task it is when you look at the degree of devastation. Many parts of this town, Wynn, Arkansas, completely unrecognizable. And some of the most chilling details I find are in the small moments of piles like this, like a fridge still full of food. We've seen toys and chairs throughout this neighborhood. And this isn't just this street. It's not just a couple streets. It's the entire town town of wind just completely decimated, changing the fabric of this community. And this was just one of more than 50 confirmed tornadoes we saw across more than a dozen states. So the devastation really has been sweeping. I spoke with the FEMA administrator. She was on the ground touring both here uh, in Wynn, Arkansas, as well as Little Rock, Arkansas. She tells me that the magnitude of these monstrous storms, the sweeping nature of them, she called it historic. President Biden signing a disaster declaration for the the state of Arkansas, and we continue to see different kinds of help uh, come on the ground here. You'll hear the buzz of the chainsaws behind me, the beeping of construction vehicles, hundreds of utility workers just in wind alone. And as I speak with different residents, you hear not just the remarkable survival stories, but also the remarkable heroics as well, Hallie. Emily Aketa live for us in Little Rock. Thank you for being there for us. Appreciate it. We've got some other breaking news into us tonight here. New details about the shooter's plans in last week's deadly attack at that elementary school in Nashville, with police saying today that the killer had planned for months to, in their words, commit mass murder at the Covenant School. That's what they're learning from journals that the shooter had, which they found in their car and bedroom. That attack, of course, killed three children and three school staff members. You see them here. I want to bring in Antonia Hilton, who is on the ground. She is covering this for us tonight. New details from police coming out that give us a sense of just how extensively planned this horrific shooting was. That's right, Hallie. So in addition to finding out that this was months of preparation on the killer's part, that they considered this for a long time. There were the plannings, these writings, both found in the car and in their home, but also that we are learning from officials, law enforcement locally on the ground, but also from the FBI, that they looked into the history of other mass shooters. They were considering other mass murders, murderers in preparation for this event. What's interesting, though, is that still local law enforcement and the FBI are saying that there's 
not much we still know, at least publicly, about the shooter's motivations. And this tragedy, of course, has become such a critical moment, not just for people living in Tennessee, but nationally right now. When we talk about the debate over uh, access to guns, over security and mental health in schools, but also over the flashpoint of fighting over the LGBTQ communities and identities in that state and in other states around the country, because there's been so many unconfirmed uh, reports, uh, speculation about how the shooter identified, and so much of an effort, both on the side of journalists, of course, and then law enforcement, to find out more about the shooter and what brought them to this point. But we know now a lot of the physical evidence, 152 rounds shot. We know a lot about the six victims lost that day, but there's still not much that we know about why this happened. Antonia Hilton, thank you so much for that update. We'll keep an eye, of course, for any more coming out from Nashville Police. Appreciate it. Let's get to a brand new NBC News exclusive right now, revealing that that Chinese spy balloon did exactly the thing that the U.S. government hoped it wasn't doing, getting intel from several sensitive U.S. military sites, according to sources familiar with that information, specifically two current and one former senior U.S. official, who tell NBC News that this balloon made, like, multiple passes over some military bases, sometimes doing a figure eight, and then sending info back to Beijing in real time, even though the Biden administration tried to block China from doing exactly this. Remember, this balloon flew over a lot of the country, and we're learning that the Chinese government sped it up, like made it go faster after people found out it existed. The U.S. shot the balloon down off the coast of South Carolina back in early February. I want to bring in Monica Albin near the White House. Some of this stuff is like video game style, Mon. You know, like there's a, they're, they're able to control how this moves, get it beaming back info in real time, et cetera. What info did the Chinese government get? Do we know? And how big of a deal is this uh, in the national security apparatus here at home? Well, this is a great scoop by my colleagues, Courtney Kuby and Carol Lee here, Hallie, that explains essentially that this Chinese balloon, as it was taking that cross-country flight over the U.S., was able to pick up on some electronic signals over sensitive military sites. So we're talking about an Air Force base in Montana, for instance. And when we're talking about these figure eight formations, it means that it could come back over, try to get a little bit more information. And according to this story, it was able to transmit some of those signals in in real time back to Beijing. And the reason that that is important is, of course, because at the time there was this huge debate and the U.S. and government officials were saying, we don't want to shoot it down right now because it doesn't pose as much of a threat in terms of what it could be capturing. They said at the time it was limited, that they were trying to do things and move things from certain sites in order to prevent that from happening. But also there was this major argument from U.S. officials that they didn't want to shoot it down over land because there would be a debris field from this, which was the size remember of a couple of school buses so all of those considerations went into this but what's critical now what we're learning from this piece of the story is again information that only has come to light through great media reporting like this from my colleagues which does show that there was more information than of course the US government would ever like to give to an adversary and remember the balloon was only shot down over off the coast of the Carolinas a couple of days later and now they are trying to reconstruct it put the debris back together together to see what they can learn from the balloon in terms of it going both ways. So if the Chinese were able to get some information from the U.S., there's a hope here that the U.S. will be able to learn a little bit, too, by putting it back together, Hallie. Monica Alba, thank you. A new signal today that we may be in for another rough summer, folks, when it comes to gas prices. That's because the price of oil is skyrocketing tonight. After this surprise move by a big group of oil producers to cut how much they'll make by a million barrels a day. They say they need to do it, basically. The cuts are a precautionary measure, in their words, supposedly to help stabilize an oil market that's been kind of rocky. So now the price of crude is way up, inching closer to that $100 a barrel benchmark. That is a number that matters because it typically precedes a spike in prices at gas stations around the country. NBC's Brian Chung joins us now. Here we were last summer, right, paying record high prices for gas. That number has gone down. People felt good about that. But this is a new surprise. The Biden administration says they got some kind of a heads up about it. But what does it mean for all of us who drive uh, and as it starts to warm up and people hit the roads? Yeah, well, with these stories, it's always a reminder of supply and demand, right? If yeah. there's less gas being produced, then that makes the prices go up. And indeed, the decision by those members of OPEC to cut production by over a million dollars a barrel, a million barrels a day will make prices go up, but only by about five to 15 cents. That's the estimate per gallon at the pump that's co that comes from gas buddy Patrick DeHaan and Analyst. 
analyst over there saying that. But for historical context, we have to remember that in April 2022, the numbers that you're looking at your full screen, West Texas intermediate crude barrels were about $100 a pop. That's much more expensive than the $80 that we're seeing right now. And unleaded gas at that time was $4, uh, $4 a gallon compared to about $3.50 right now. So even if the price goes up by about 5 to 15 cents, that doesn't mean that we're going to see prices close to what we saw in the uh recall around June, we were seeing $5 a gallon nationally. Now, that seems to be a much higher than where we would go as a result of these OPEC production cuts. But of course, there's a lot of other factors that go into there. Demand, uh, the war in Ukraine, those things could right. further exacerbate the prices. What options does the White House have here? Because you look at the countries that we're dependent on for foreign oil, many of them, most of them are part of this OPEC plus alliance, right? So what, what can the Biden administration do here to avoid some of the consequences potentially? Yeah, well, on one hand, we have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That's something that the Department of Energy can actually lever. It's essentially about, they have right now, about 371 million barrels in the tank that they could release. You increase the supply by tapping that SPR, and you can get the prices down. But you also have to remember that what makes it so different now compared to the oil embargo of the 1970s is that the United States is a much larger producer now domestically. So you could pressure the U.S. producers here stateside to increase their output. Now, the Biden administration administration's success in doing that when the war in Ukraine happened last year was not so strong. But then one other thing that you could do as well is try to limit the exports of gas and diesel. This is something that the Department of Energy actually considered at the end of last year when they were worried about how cold this winter was going to get. They ultimately didn't do that. But this is all a reminder that the Biden administration has levers to do something about this if prices go too high, Allie. Brian Chung, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, the Virginia teacher shot by her six-year-old student is now filing a $40 million lawsuit. The warnings that she now says the school ignored and the exclusive interview with her attorneys. Plus, there's an election tomorrow that some people are calling the most important race of this year. We're getting into how just one Supreme Court seat in one state could transform the rest of the country. That's coming up. The Virginia elementary school teacher who was shot by her six-year-old student is filing a $40 million lawsuit against the school board and three former administrators. Attorneys for the teacher telling our Savannah Guthrie in an exclusive interview that the shooting was a personal attack against Abigail Zwerner that could have been prevented. But they say the district blew off warnings and failed to stop the shooting from happening. Watch. We believe the facts will support the fact that they knew that they had three complaints, and then eventually a teacher comes down there and says one of the students has actually seen the gun. At that point in time, you have a ticking time bomb in the school, and the school failed to do anything about it. In just the last couple of minutes, we are getting new comment now from the school board, which tells NBC News tonight they haven't gotten the legal documents yet. When they are served, they're going to work with counsel. They say their thoughts and prayers are with Abby Zwerner, the teacher, that they're working to address safety, security, and student behavior. I want to bring in Maggie Vespa. And Maggie, like I mentioned, that new response from the school district, which says the safety of staff and students is the top priority. But this lawsuit is sure. making some new claims about what led up to this shooting, specifically as it relates to that six-year-old. Help us understand it. Yeah, it really paints a picture that goes back even into the previous school year and kind of gives a lot of context as to why teachers um, now say that the district failed to act when it should have. In short, basically, the lawsuit calls this a personal attack against Warner that she says could have been prevented. Even this morning, her attorneys on the Today Show calling this a ticking time bomb, saying that the uh, defendants, which include, by the way, the former assistant principal and principal, who have now both either been step removed from their jobs or stepped down from those jobs since the shooting, that they knew about both a history of violence with this student and both that that student had a gun at school that day. The history of violence, one specific example, the suit alleges that the student had in the prior school year actually strangled a different teacher and was allowed to stay in school, in class, obviously, for months beyond that. Here's part of that exclusive sit down that Savannah had with Abigail Werner's attorneys this morning on today. Take a listen. It's an assumption of the job that a four, first grade teacher is going to be shot by their own student, a six year old. Uh, that is unacceptable. That's outrageous. Um, and that's not what happened here. 
So the attorney there kind of paraphrasing what they expect, basically, the school district to come back with, which they say is likely a workers' comp defense, saying that this, to yeah. some degree, they expect it to be argued, is just kind of a sort of predictable part of the job and something that they cannot, a person cannot turn around and sue their employer for. Again, at this point, they are alleging there is a history, according to the suit, of random violence that was known to all defendants in this case. And that yeah. paints kind of a far more detailed picture of what we knew to be going on inside that school, Hallie. Well, you mentioned something interesting, Maggie, pulling that thread of the idea of the workers' comp argument and how this plays into yeah. the next phase of this legal fight. Explain it. Yeah, so let's walk through the list of defendants in this case, because as I said, we have the former uh, principal, the former assistant principal, the former superintendent, and the school board at Newport News Public Schools. So all of them named, all of them, according to the suit, um, Zwarner and her attorneys allege, knew about, again, this history of violence for the student and knew that he had brought a gun to school that day. At this point, we have that response that you write at the top of the segment from the school board itself. The superintendent has told us no comment at this time. We have not gotten a comment from the principal or the assistant principal. But in the past, the principal's attorney has said she did not know the student had a gun at school that day. So we expect to hear the workers' comp defense that we just talked about. We also expect to hear a lot of intricacies of who knew what that day, that day back in January when Zerner was shot inside her first grade classroom. Again, this is a $40 million lawsuit. Zwerner's attorney is saying she has permanent injuries and that her life was forever changed by that day, Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the body of Stephen Smith has now been exhumed and autopsied, according to lawyers for his family. Smith's death in 2015 got a lot more attention during Alec Murdoch's murder trial since Smith's body had been found near the Murdoch family property. Local law enforcement originally ruled Smith's death an accident, but now say they're investigating it as a homicide. Number two, the meeting between Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the president of Taiwan is officially set. It'll happen Wednesday at the Reagan Presidential Library in California. China is not happy about this. Remember, China claims Taiwan is its own territory. It's already said that any kind of meeting like this would be a provocation, and they're threatening to retaliate. Number three, McDonald's is shutting down its corporate offices until Wednesday to get ready to lay off hundreds of employees. It's part of a big plan corporate restructuring that was first announced back in January. The CEO says it's not really about cutting costs, but about making sure they can innovate faster. Number four, Twitter's CEO Elon Musk has apparently changed the social media platform's logo to a pic of the Doge meme. No longer the little bird, at least for now. No Nobody really knows why. Nobody's really sure. There's some speculation. Maybe it's like an old April Fool's joke, belatedly. After the change happened, the price of the crypto Dogecoin skyrocketed. Its logo, of course, is the Doge. Number five, happy 50th anniversary to the very first cell phone call made by an engineer from Motorola on a phone the size of a brick who called a rival engineer at AT&T to brag a little. Fair. The first cell phone cost about $12,000 and to be able to use it for 30 minutes, it took 10 hours to charge. Something to consider maybe next time you're annoyed when your iPhone dies. We are just hours away now from polls opening in Wisconsin in what's being called the most important election of the year, where voters are gonna decide if liberals or conservatives will control the state's Supreme Court. Why does that matter? If you don't live in Wisconsin, it's because of this. The decisions that that court could make might have a ripple effect across the whole country. Here's the deal. The court's been controlled by conservatives for years, but a right-leaning justice is set to retire. That leaves a 3-3 split. It means the race's more liberal candidate could flip the majority to her side. The election tomorrow is technically nonpartisan, but the candidates have been getting back up from the state's local Democratic and Republican parties, as well as more liberal and more conservative groups, respectively. They're also not hiding their political leanings and all the dozens of ads being run on local TV right now. Listen. Dan Kelly doesn't believe that women should even have that freedom. On the Supreme Court, Dan Kelly will uphold the criminal ban on abortion. Janet Protosiewicz is a Milwaukee County judge with a long history of letting dangerous criminals back into our streets. NBC Shaq Brewster is covering this one. He is joining us now live from Waukesha, Wisconsin, a place we know well. Um, obviously, this is a big deal for people who live in the state where you are. But if you're in Texas or California or Florida or wherever, explain why you should care about this race, because there's a reason to. 
Yeah, Hallie, and you know, when you talk to liberals in this state, they say that it's about protecting democracy. That was the actual question I put to the campaign today. Janet Protasiewicz, Protasiewicz excuse me, has been uh, sick off the campaign trail, but she had an actual liberal justice on the Supreme Court in her place. Listen to her response when I asked, why should people from outside the state of Wisconsin care about this race? People outside of Wisconsin should care about this court race for a number of reasons. We are about a 50-50 state, yet we have a legislature that is 70% Republican right now. I think the nation looks at that and sees something that doesn't look very democratic. I think this election stands for a chance to, to stand up for democracy. And Hallie, they say that there are presidential level implications to this race. They point back to 2020 when former President Trump's attorneys tried to throw out some hundreds of thousands of ballots in Democratic areas, Milwaukee and Madison. At the time, you had three conservative justices on the state Supreme Court that sided with the former president's campaign. They argue that if Daniel Kelly, the conservative justice running for uh, the court right now, if he were on the court at the time, that would be a fourth justice to make the majority, putting that election into question. So they're saying that it's not just about what happens here in Wisconsin, yeah. but it could have an impact on who wins the president at that national level. You are wearing, I know, your campaign reporter hat here or your campaign reporter half zip talking with voters, with volunteers who are in this race. What are they saying? Why are they saying um, yeah. about wanting to turn out, getting people to turn out? Why is it important to them? Yeah, with the Supreme Court race, there are so many issues at stake. There's abortion, redistricting, the power of the governor, power of unions. But the issue that comes up the most, both in ads and conversations with voters, is the issue of abortion in this state where abortion is effectively banned based on an 1849 abortion ban that went into effect after the overturning of Roe. I want you to listen to some of the conversations with voters I had. The first voter who said that she usually doesn't vote in an election like this. I have a 19-year-old daughter, so, you know, who's in office, it matters for her future. Women's rights, is that what's driving you to the polls tomorrow? Yes, it is. Why? Why? I don't want any man telling me what to do. I just had a couple of conversations with some conservative voters, and they said abortion, too. Protecting that ban on abortion in this state, protecting life, in their words, uh, is something that's driving them to the poll. So this is an election that usually we wouldn't be talking about, Hallie. Usually there wouldn't be that much attention on a spring election in an odd number a uh, year. But a lot of people are focused on it because of that one issue, abortion, which we've been talking about since November, Hallie. I think you've laid it out well, Shaq Brewster. Thank you. Appreciate it. When we come back here on the show, the CDC says people who may have gotten sick from drug-resistant bacteria linked to eye drops, even if they didn't use those eye drops, may have been infected. What we know about potential person-to-person -person spread after the break. The CDC tonight giving out a new warning that a drug-resistant bacteria first linked to some eye drops now seems to be spreading from person to person, even if you didn't use those eye drops. They're saying that they've identified case patients, what they call, who didn't report or remember the use of these artificial tears. We've told you how serious this strain of bacteria is, connected to nearly 70 infections in 16 states. Three people died. Eight people went blind. Four people had to lose an eyeball. The eye drop company, Ezra Care, says it's cooperating with the CDC and the FDA. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. And Dr. John, the concern now, right, is that this seems to be spreading from person to person, even if you didn't actually use the eye drops in the first place. And that is a concern, Hallie. And like they said, these are people who don't recall or did never, never use the eye drops. And so the concern here is this is a bacteria. We know bacteria can easily spread from person to person if we don't take pop, proper precautions. And we think that's what's happening here, especially for certain populations. We're talking about people with compromised immune system, people that might be in long-term type facilities, people who might have certain procedures done to them where they have indwelling catheters or other types of things in their body that could be putting, uh, basically letting the bacteria into their body. And once that happens, it can be very hard to treat because this bacteria, Pseudomonas originosa, which is a very bad bacteria, also has started to become drug resistant and very drug resistant, which means it's going to be harder to treat. And I think that's a result of what we're seeing here, Hallie. When you talk about the ways that they're trying to keep it from spreading then, like, right, what are the proper protocols for something like this? Because as a lay person, I would look at this and go, OK, don't use the eye drops. Like, OK, that clearly is not the solve here. 
And that's the first step is don't use the eye drops and make sure it's not in your house that you've gotten rid of it. CDC and the FDA are working together to try and make sure that it gets removed from the shelves and that people and doctors understand that they need to get rid of those eye drops. On top of that, they're sending out warnings to doctors saying, hey, spend extra time and take extra precautions to make sure your patients don't have this. And if they do, they are asking for help with the doctors to genetically profile this bacteria. In other words, to look at the genotype of this bacteria to help them do that so they can make sure it's all coming from a similar source and it's a similar bacteria. As we found out during the pandemic, these things can mutate into other forms. They're trying to make sure that this doesn't happen and they can figure out where exactly this is coming from and make sure that they stop it. This is the way they try to slow it down. So far, haven't been super successful at it, but hopefully as time goes on, we end up slowing us down and eliminating this completely, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, the American journalist detained in Russia is now appealing his arrest. And we've just learned in literally the last couple of seconds that he's received a visit now behind bars. What's being said about his condition and his mood right now? Plus, NASA naming the astronauts going on a really historic moon mission. In tonight's original, by that flight, has the space agency turning to AI for some extra help in missions to come. We are just learning here in the last couple of minutes of the first visit by an independent monitor to that American journalist being held in Russia on spying charges, Evan Gershkovich. A human rights monitor has just spoken with him behind bars and says that Gershkovich, Gershkovich rather, is cheerful, cheerful and in good spirits with his lawyers officially his, appealing his arrest today. It's all coming as some European countries say they're planning to confront Russia at a UN Security Council meeting this week. It comes after a rare phone call between Secretary of State Tony Blinken and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in which the State Department says Blinken called for the Kremlin to let Gershkovich go immediately. The journal denies the spying charges against him. Lawmakers, in the meantime, are looking to show a united front against Russia with a visit to Ukraine today. Josh Letterman is joining us now. Let's start with this new information, Josh, about this human rights monitor who, who was able to go and to meet with uh, this detained American journalist who's behind bars. That's right, Hallie. And let's be clear, this isn't like an Amnesty International representative. This is Russia's equivalent of a human rights uh, monitor, the closest got thing that they it, have got it. to okay. that, who's okay. able to access people in prison. So, right, we should take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it is encouraging well, Josh, that, that that's monitor who visited him. that's a boulder of salt. That's an important clarification here, because this is not an independent human rights monitor. This is a Russian saying, like, of course the Russians are going to say that. This is giving me deja vu from Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan here. Until somebody who right. is independent is able to meet somebody from the embassy, let's say. That hasn't happened yet with Gershkovich, right? Correct. And that is why it is so critical to the U.S. government that they get consular access to him, that they be able to have their own eyes and ears on what's happening with him. But at least we do have some specifics, according to this Russian uh, rights monitor who says that he is in a quarantine cell but does have access to a television, to a pair uh, of clean clothes, that he uh, has been in decent spirits and uh, that he is getting proper food, such as uh, porridge for breakfast. He had chicken and cabbage soup. Uh, uh, for lunch, according to uh, this monitor. So a few details that at least uh, make clear some of the conditions that he's under, even as the U.S. wants to make sure they can verify that themselves. Um, talk through a little bit more about the, I mean, we mentioned the appeal that has been filed today. We mentioned what could come down at this U.N. Right. Security Council meeting. How do you see things unfolding over the next week as it seems like European nations and the U.S. are looking to up the pressure on Russia, especially after the phone call between Blinken and Lavrov? Well, it doesn't seem like there's any major breakthrough imminent. After that Lavrov Blinken phone call, it seems to be both sides just kind of tossing back the same accusations. And uh, at the Security Council uh, sessions that are coming up, you know, Russia is the rotating president uh, of the Security Council, meaning they're going to kind of dictate what the agenda is. But Russia already has a veto on the Security Council, meaning they can really block anything coming out of that body uh, that is critical of Russia. Uh, but it does seem like these other nations who are part of that group really want to use this moment as they are anticipating a new uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive uh, to really try to pu uh, push up the diplomatic, uh, military and economic pressure on Moscow. 
Before I let you go, Josh, we talk about the pressure on Russia, right? Talk more about this visit from, I believe it was um, the top Republican on the Intel Committee, right, that has traveled now to Ukraine, met with right. President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv. Uh, at the same time, I believe also today we had former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also in Ukraine. Well, this is good news for Ukrainians who have been worried about House Republicans, particularly those rank and file Republicans who have questioned continued U.S. military and economic assistance to Ukraine. But the real question is whether many of the weapons the U.S. has been sending Ukraine, those M1A1 Abrams tanks, are going to make it to Ukraine in time for them to use it in their counteroffensive, which uh, many experts expect to start really any day now, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Live for us from overseas. Lots to cover today. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories, in fact, every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, two suspects have been arrested and charged with murder in connection with a string of robberies in New York City gay bars that have left two people dead. Officials have also named a third suspect who they think is connected to this and said the three are part of a bigger citywide robbery pattern. From our Southern Bureau, the Florida Governor, Ron DeSantis, a Republican, has signed a bill today to let people carry a concealed weapon without a permit starting July 1st. The NRA says it's a day to celebrate. But opponents of this say they think it could increase gun violence in that state. Florida now becomes the 26th state with permitless carry legislation. And from our Midwest Bureau, take a look at this. A truck hitting a house, oof, right in the middle of the night. The door, it was the ring cams, like the doorbell cameras that caught it happening. Luckily, the family inside was not home at the time, but you see how far in that truck got. It did so much damage to the house that the family can't live there right now. No word yet on what caused the crash or if the driver was arrested. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's NASA now naming the four astronauts it'll send to orbit the moon in the next Artemis mission. Three Americans, one Canadian, there they are. The big rollout taking the stage today. Jeremy Hansen, Victor Glover, Reed Wiseman, Christina Hammock-Cook. They're part of this ambitious push to establish a permanent base on the moon and to prep for a mission to Mars. But all of this activity means a new challenge building rockets and spaceships and equipment fast enough to respond to obstacles out in space. So now, NASA engineers are turning to AI to help design customized parts that are more advanced than ever. Tom Costello has the story. Here at the Goddard Space Flight Center outside of Washington, NASA research engineer Ryan McClelland is pioneering the use of artificial intelligence to design parts of the spacecraft of the future. In science fiction, there's always thousands of people living in space and these huge structures in space. And what I'm hoping this enables is us to get there. He calls them evolved structures. A lot of people comment that they look like alien bones. And it's no coincidence that they look like bones because they develop the same way that bones develop. The process starts with NASA leadership tapping McClellan's team to bring two components of a spacecraft together. The first thing is to get the requirements, you know, exactly what the part has to do. And then step two is to let the AI tool run and evolve over 30 to 40 iterations. And the next step is you make it with digital manufacturing. The new technology allows NASA engineers to shorten the time it takes to develop specialty parts for spacecraft from months down to just days. Plus, the parts are lighter, stronger, and they use less material than most human designs. This is a bracket for the Excite mission, which is a uh, balloon experiment that goes up above most of Earth's atmosphere and actually looks at exoplanet atmospheres. So this is just sort of a, a simple bracket that holds a optical assembly to the back of a telescope. Dr. Joe Hill Kettle leads NASA's engineering and technology directorate. The most important thing to me is this is the future of NASA and the future of, of space flight and the future of space instrumentation. She says the technology could be a vital resource for future missions. If we're going to have the sustained presence on, on the lunar surface or eventually on the Mars surface, that the additive machine creation of these parts and the, and the rapid turnaround would allow those folks to be able to, to perhaps fix things in real time, be able to build things off planet. But McClellan says aspiring engineers shouldn't worry. This technology will not completely replace humans, at least not yet. Where it stands right now and where I see it in the near future is that it's kind of like a consultant that allows us to be more productive, but the human designers still need it. Artificial intelligence improving spaceflight one piece at a time.
Tom Costello is joining us now live from Houston, where he's been covering the latest on the Artemis mission. So let's get back to that Artemis II and this announcement today. Talk through kind of this new generation of astronauts, what they're saying about the future here. Well, they're thrilled, as you could imagine. And this entire aircraft hangar today was filled with people who are absolutely thrilled. Other astronauts, astronauts' families, NASA staffers, politicians. But this is what's fascinating. These four astronauts, three Americans, one Canadian, are going to be headed to the moon. The last time humans walked on the moon, these people weren't even born yet. I mean, that really makes you feel, makes me feel old to realize that. But an astonishing group of people, you, I always feel like an underachiever around these folks. They are just unbelievably accomplished in their fields, accomplished in NASA. You've got uh, Canadian fighter pilots, two American naval fighter pilots, an electrical engineer and Christina Cook, who is also uh, was a, a, a spacewalker with another woman, the first ever female only spacewalk. So a lot of accomplishment among all of these guys and their mission will take off, lift off in late 2024, they hope. And I'm sure you do as well. Tom Costello, thank you for that live for us in Houston. Appreciate it. Still to come, the big March Madness finale happens tonight. Whoever wins will make history. We're on the ground for the game and the one shining moment coming up. So in just the last couple of minutes, we've heard about the legit record-breaking numbers from the Women's National Championship basketball game. Nearly 10 million people tuned in to watch LSU break a tournament record with 102 points on Iowa for the Tigers' first ever championship. ESPN says this is the most watched women's basketball game ever, ever on record. Okay, tons of eyeballs, big deal. And that's going to make tonight's men's matchup pretty tough to beat. UConn versus San Diego State just a few hours from now. An all-time upset matchup. It is the first time since 2014 that neither team is a one, two, or three seed. So back in 2014, who won the last time that happened? Well, UConn. The Huskies hoping to do it again to cap off one of the most dominant runs ever in this tournament. Their average margin of victory, nearly 21 points. It's the third biggest of all times as they look for their fifth national title. Sam Brock is in Houston. Let me just start it off, Sam, uh, with a bit of a brag, not for me, but for my team. Six of the top 10 in our network's March Madness pool are from this show team. There are a bunch of basketball baddies, but I got to say, not even they saw this final coming. Give us the vibe check in Houston. What's it like? Did you talk to folks from Connecticut, from, from the, the people who are out going to this thing? Talk us through it. So, so first of all, basketball baddies. I love that. I don't know who came up with that term, but it's amazing. And what, do you mean me, Nothing less what do you mean me, Sam? What do you mean? Nothing Jackson, team. <laughs> you probably came up with it. Um, let me just set the vibe for you right now. It is just phenomenal, right? I know, make no mistake about it, you talked about the history of having a four and a five seed with UConn and San Diego State, but UConn Halley is a traditionally incredibly talented basketball program with a rich history. They've won four national titles. Were they to win this year, it would be five, tying them with Duke and Indiana for fourth most all time. And that team that you're looking on your screen right now is basically an NBA team playing against a bunch of Division I college schools. That's how talented they are, multifaceted. They have seven-footers, guards that can score, an incredible upperclassman leadership. Hallie, we just interviewed the family of Andre Jackson Jr. He is one of their guards. I talked a little bit about how close-knit they were growing up. Uh, I talked to his brother, Marcus. He said that Marcus told me, you know, they were thick as thieves growing up, but that obviously Andre had more talent than anyone else. As a football player, he would take every single handoff and take it to the house for 70 yards. Now <laughs> translate that to a basketball court. That's the kind of athletes we're talking about, but they're from Amsterdam, New York, upstate New York. That entire town right now is going nuts, and it just makes you think about the impact that the schools and their success have on their communities. Yeah. How it brings people together, especially right now, is just so powerful to see, Hallie. It's such a good point, Sam, and I, th I hope that people watch tonight, right, just for that that part of it alone, even though we just laid out those gangbusters numbers for the women's game. Like, it's, it's tough to see, and I, this isn't me speaking, this is kind of experts and analysts who suggest it, it's unlikely the men are going to get that, that many eyeballs necessarily because there's just not so many so-called blue blood schools like the big, the Dukes, the North Carolinas who are in this final. Right, exactly. So last year you had Duke, North Carolina, and Kansas in the Final Four. That is not the same 
case this year. Obviously, there's a lot of national attention on this. But back to the women for a second. To give you some context for the figure that Please. you just cited, 9.9 .9 million people that watched the national championship game. When Iowa, Caitlin Clark, played Louisville a few days ago, they had 2.5 million. Okay, that's about a quarter of what you just cited. That was wow. higher than any number that ESPN had received. can't hear me. I was asking Sorry, your photographer. I don't know if you can still hear me. Yeah, it's pan yes, over. Sorry, can we see pan it? over for a second, guys, so they can see what we're talking about. Yep. Yeah, actually, there's a crew here, Ali. It's going to be a little tricky. He's going to try. That's all right. But you've got, uh, let me walk you through this. You've got fans that are about to leave for the game. They had a three Aww. buses that already were sent off. The players are coming out, Hallie, within the next hour, as is the band. They're going to be performing for them as they get onto the buses to go to NRG Stadium. So what you're talking about here, I'm going to duck in this side. Hey, guys, it's me again, uh, is just really the atmosphere. You can't replace this. There's no facsimile like it in sports. College basketball is amazing. The families are all here. The friends are here. The support is incredible. And we just hope to see a good game tonight. But, man, a lot on the line. You get the best assignment. Sam Brock, have fun tonight. Thank you. Thanks to your photographer as well for that quick game. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. We are coming on the air with former President Trump right now in New York, ahead of a moment that will make history less than 24 hours from now. The new details on what we expect to hear at his arraignment, the city bracing for protests, and Mr. Trump adding new muscle to his legal team tonight. We're live on the ground with what you need to know before he heads to court tomorrow. We're also live in Arkansas, a state getting ready for round two of major storms, even as it's just starting to soar through what's left from the last round of storms, those deadly tornadoes that killed dozens of people. Plus, new tonight, police in Nashville saying the shooter who killed three kids and three adults at an elementary school had planned to commit mass murder. What else we're learning from this manifesto? And how a deadly drug-resistant bacteria infecting people initially from contaminated eye drops is spreading even more now. Why experts say it's such a concern. And in tonight's original, four astronauts have just learned they're going to go farther than any humans have ever gone into space. We'll talk more about that and how NASA might use AI to help them orbit the moon. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and former President Trump is right now in Trump Tower. Six o'clock Eastern, that is where he is, getting ready for a day tomorrow that will make history, when he will become the first former president indicted and arraigned for a crime. As we learn more tonight about how things are going to go down tomorrow. If you're curious about it, we've got it for you, right? Sometime mid-afternoon, you're going to see Mr. Trump at this courthouse in Manhattan. He's going to be fingerprinted. No DNA will be taken. TBD on a mugshot, we don't know. We think he's probably going to be with the new lawyer he just hired. More on that in a minute. We don't, at this point, know more about the security apparatus other than there will be a lot of it here. As we look at that point after he gets fingerprinted and this sort of processing happens at what happens next, what the charges are, this indictment that will be unsealed probably at that point. That's really important because we don't know specifics of the charges here. It is our sourcing that suggests that he's facing something like 30 fraud-related charges connected to alleged hush money payments to former adult film star Stormy Daniels. That's from people familiar with this. The details here are going to matter. After the arraignment, you've got the former president going to turn right around. He's going to head right back home to Mar-a-Lago in his plane, where he's expected to speak at 8.15 Eastern tomorrow night. We'll have special coverage right here. You've probably seen the moment he got back to Midtown Manhattan, to his apartment. You see this quick shot, the shot, the wave. You see him waving to some demonstrators there, one of our producers on the ground, getting that look up close and personal with Donald Trump coming back in. We expect him to stay down at Trump Tower for the evening before tomorrow morning. Tomorrow midday, when he obviously gets that motorcade, heads down to the courthouse for all of the proceedings here. This was after his plane touched down at LaGuardia Airport in New York. Look at his name right on the side. I mean, that's what he flies with. If you see it there, you probably saw it everywhere. This was plastered across cable news. It was live as he was in the air, on the air, a sign of just how much of a scene this is. Even Mr. Trump's son, Eric, tweeted that his dad was watching his own planes take off live over on Fox News. So, yeah, a scene, but it is also history. 
history that the former president clearly doesn't like. He's posting online, this country's gone to hell. He wants to move the trial out of Manhattan. That's a long shot. He wants to remove the borough's district attorney, Alvin Bragg. That's a non-starter. And you've got Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Trump ally, who's set to host a demonstration tomorrow. She's going to then head back to Florida to be there for that primetime speech that we talked about that the former president will give. Tonight, you've got New York City ready for any other protest tomorrow, with the city's mayor saying there's no specific threat, but he does have a warning. While there may be some rabble rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, a message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. All of this could change at any moment, and this is something that we have never seen before. This is unprecedented. I mean, we talk about the use of that word and how overused it's been, but it really does warrant uh, the use of, uh, like, it, we, we have to call it what it is, right? And we've seen and heard this from the people here in Manhattan today. Let me just set the scene here. Midtown Manhattan, an area where a lot of tourists flock, and this is a, a, an area where folks are often shopping on uh, the face famous designer stores on Fifth Avenue, right? But today, the, that historic nature of this day that you were mentioning was not lost on anyone here, not lost on the media, not lost on the police, and certainly not lost on the tourists. As uh, the former president made his way to Trump Tower, we saw uh, massive crowds gather here. Everyone I was looking at had their phones out. They were recording and documenting that moment. We had shoppers flying overhead, a major crowd building in front of Trump Tower. Since then, things have calmed down a bit. But the anticipation has been building here. And while things have been fairly quiet, other than the hubbub around that, uh, that moment where he was entering Trump Tower today, we anticipate that tomorrow things will look a little bit different with Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, the congresswoman heading down to protest, uh, and the press conferences that will be held. It's going to be perhaps a much more active day in terms of what we're going to hear and what we're going to see from, from demonstrators here tomorrow, Hallie. Yeah. Uh, there's also sort of the politics of this, too, in addition to the legal piece of it. Legally, you got the former president's yeah. team saying they want to keep cameras out of court. Politically, you've got them raising something like more than $7 million, the campaign, just since news of this indictment first broke. What are you hearing from folks in and around the campaign, Dasha? Yeah, I mean, look, the lawyers are focused on the case. Trump more so perhaps focused on the campaign at this point and trying to capitalize on this moment. We have seen a lot of fundraising emails come through ever since this indictment dropped. We've seen indictment swag advertised by the campaign. They're really trying to use this moment, it seems, to rally the troops. They put out that the, a statement saying that the Trump campaign raised more than $4 million in the 24 hours since the indictment. That's now up to $7 million, according to the campaign, saying they've also gotten a lot of first-time volunteers signed up. And as I've been talking to Republican voters, most people I talk to do say that they are energized and fueled by this indictment, saying that it has made them more likely to support the former president in the primary. But of course, we have to remember, uh, Hallie, this is a certain audience that we're talking about. And while it may benefit the former president in the short term, there is a longer term game here that uh, is a different audience that we're talking about uh, when it comes to the general public, those independent voters. So the calculation right now may not necessarily uh, play out in the way that they're hoping for down the line, but that we're just going to have to wait and see. Dasha Burns, thank you very much. Let me bring in Danny Savalos now, our legal analyst here. New hire has now come on board here, Todd Blanche, apparently. Uh, somebody who knows Manhattan well. He was a federal prosecutor in this area for years. He resigned from his white-collar firm to take on this job representing Donald Trump. He used to represent somebody else who Donald Trump knows, Paul Manafort, Danny. What does it say to you he's coming on board here? I, a former federal prosecutor, I mean, that is that says a lot about a resume. Uh, Donald Trump, likes folks that are have good resumes. He's very impressed with people's resumes. Uh, he's already got good counsel in the form of Joe Tacopina. So, look, he's building his legal team. He's going to need someone who's local to New York because you're going to need someone familiar with the procedural rules here, although the procedural rules are largely, in many ways, going to be thrown out the window because you have such an unusual defendant here that you have to change at least some of the things when it comes to calendaring the case and uh, procedures like tomorrow in which the entire courthouse is going to be closed for one defendant. That gives you an idea of how different this is. 
Danny, you know, there is a risk here for Donald Trump politically, right? Our Laura Jarrett spoke with some former prosecutors who say, like, hey, if he keeps talking about this, about the judge overseeing this, not just the case, is there a potential for a gag order? What do you think? Because one of the conversations that Laura and I had was about, you know, he is a presidential candidate. There is a free speech component to this for not just Donald Trump, but for any, uh, any person who is going to be arraigned here like this. Yeah, gag orders always implicate the First Amendment, and particularly when it comes to political speech. Political speech is arguably the most cherished, protected kind of speech. That's why it can get so nasty, too, is because it is so protected uh, under our First Amendment. So a gag order has to only be issued if there is a probability that there is a serious threat to the right to a fair trial. I don't see a gag order here, and I could be wrong, but when you think about it, Trump won't want one. Uh, the DA's office may say they want one, but do they really want a gag order? Trump is out there making statements, as you pointed out, and those are all things that the government can use against him later on, whether it's by tweet or at a rally. And uh, folks have done that before. Think about the will be wild tweet. That has become right. a focal point in the January 6th investigation. So why not, if I'm the DA's office, let him go out there, let him make all these statements and get himself in trouble. And if you're concerned about things like threats to the judiciary or the DA's office, well, threats are crimes. So you can't commit crimes. If he issues some kind of threat, go out and arrest him, charge him with a new crime. If I'm the DA's office, I do not push for a gag order in this case. What about the other cases in front of Donald Trump here? Because the focus is going to be on this one, obviously, in the Manhattan, the Manhattan, the, the, that the Manhattan district attorney is bringing tomorrow, Danny. But there's others. There's a special counsel investigation into January 6th and to classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. And then there's the one in Georgia about election interference. Our Blaine Alexander is hearing from a source close to that DA in Fulton County that she is watching how things unfold in Manhattan. Obviously, two separate cases. That's been made clear. If you were in the district attorney's shoes in Georgia, how, how would you be watching what happens tomorrow or would you be at all, Danny? Help us understand that. Substantively, none of these cases overlap. Practically, totally. of course they do. Of course, these prosecutors don't want to be the last to the show if they're planning to indict Trump. Now, the special counsel's office, maybe they're watching. I mean, obviously they are. But they have to continue their investigation, and they'll be ready when they're ready. But don't be surprised if there's a subtle psychological pull for these other prosecutors' investigations to hurry up and get in on the fun and indict the president if they're planning to do that, because they don't want to be late to the game. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll be talking again in the hours to come. Appreciate it. We are just hours away from another storm, by the way, pounding nearly the same area that just got decimated by deadly tornadoes. With 35 million people at risk of yet another round of twisters, hail, of more. This map, you're looking at it right here. Guys, this looks almost identical to the map we showed you last week and the places that are most at risk for these really scary tornadoes. The difference here, there's going to be multiple rounds of storms, not just run one round like we saw before. But that one round, boy, did it do a lot. Look at this. Neighborhoods just decimated, totally flattened. 32 people killed with more than 50 confirmed tornadoes sweeping through 15 states. Our team caught up with one man in Arkansas who said, hey, this is not normal. Listen. We had never seen nothing like this in this town. Not this much devastation. In New Jersey, tornadoes hit in Delaware, too, where one person died. That's the state's first tornado death in 40 years. Emily Aketa is live for us now in Arkansas. Emily, I can't even bear to think about the people who are dealing with what I see behind you in this live shot here, who are now bracing for maybe another round of storms on the way. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. Right now, they are salvaging anything they can as quickly as they can. And you can see just how daunting of a task it is when you look at the degree of devastation. Many parts of this town win Arkansas completely unrecognizable. And some of the most chilling details I find are in the small moments of piles like this, like a fridge still full of food. We've seen toys and chairs throughout this neighborhood. And this isn't just this street. It's not just a couple streets. It's the entire town. 
town of Wynn just completely decimated, changing the fabric of this community. And this was just one of more than 50 confirmed tornadoes we saw across more than a dozen states. So the devastation really has been sweeping. I spoke with the FEMA administrator. She was on the ground touring both here uh, in Wynn, Arkansas, as well as Little Rock, Arkansas. She tells me that the magnitude of these monstrous storms, the sweeping nature of them, she called it historic. President Biden signing a disaster declaration for the state of Arkansas. And we continue to see different kinds of help uh, come on the ground here. You'll hear the buzz of the chainsaws behind me, the beeping of construction vehicles, hundreds of utility workers just in wind alone. And as I speak with different residents, you hear not just the remarkable survival stories, but also the remarkable heroics as well, Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you for being there for us. Appreciate it. Some breaking news now into us, some new details about the shooter's plan in last week's deadly attack at an elementary school in Nashville. With police saying today the killer had planned for months to, in their words, commit mass murder at the Covenant School. That's what they're learning from journals the shooter had, which they found in their car and bedroom. The attack killed three children. You see them here and three school staff members. And it comes the same day as we're seeing more calls for changes to the state's gun laws. Just today, look at this. There was a walkout organized by some students around Nashville who marched on Tennessee's capital. They want lawmakers to do something. They specifically want a ban on assault weapons. Let's bring in Antonia Hilton, who's been covering this for us. And let's start with the new info that we're getting from police here, which, Antonia, gives us some new insight into how extensively planned it appears this attack was. That's right, Hallie. What we've learned apparently coming from writings that they left behind in their car and also that at, from their home, that this was in the works for months. And not only that, but that they also studied, they looked at the stories of past mass shooters. And the, we also got a bit more insight from officials today, both local and federal level law enforcement, about the physical evidence found on the ground. So 152 rounds shot. What's interesting, though, about this case, and you and I have covered a lot of these, is that there's still so little known about the motivation, an established yeah. motive from law enforcement right now. And that's a little bit unusual. At this point, in many of these cases, you think back to even just recently, Buffalo or Uvalde, we knew a lot more about the shooter's history, why they came to that place, and with what intent they carried this out. There's so much about the shooter we still don't know. And it's an interesting story because it comes at such a critical moment. You mentioned these walkouts, students in Tennessee fighting for gun reform there. You know, this is a state where people think of the gun question really being off the table, frankly, but we're seeing large numbers one day last week. And then today again, students from colleges and high schools coming together and demanding more from their legislators. But it's also coming at a time when LGBTQ rights and there's been a lot of speculation about the identification of the shooter. They are really boiling over with a number of bills in the Tennessee legislature. And so this story hits at so much of that. Yeah. And there's still so much we need to know about this investigation. And, you know, we, we of course have to be careful because in the midst of there being a lack of information. Often there's disinformation and rumor. But right now, what we know about the shooter is that they planned this for a long time. And I'm sure we'll know more soon about why. Antonia Hilton, thank you very much. A brand new NBC News exclusive for you tonight, revealing that Chinese spy balloon. You remember that? It apparently did the thing that the U.S. government hoped it wasn't doing, getting intel from some sensitive military sites, according to two current and one former senior U.S. official, telling our team that this balloon apparently made multiple passes over some military bases, sometimes doing a figure eight, and then sending info back to Beijing in real time. That's even though the Biden administration tried to block China from doing exactly this. I know you remember all these pictures of that balloon, the video of it getting shot down over the coast of South Carolina. The balloon flew over a lot of the country. We're also finding out now that the Chinese government, according to these sources, sped the balloon up, basically made it go faster after people found out it existed. I want to bring in now Monica Alba, who is live for us near the White House. Um, the national security piece of this was always the focus. I mean, that was the reason why there was such a hubbub about this balloon when our Courtney QB first broke that it even existed and set off this series of reporting. Now she and Carol Lee are back with this scoop here. Mon, talk us through it and why it's so significant. 
It's significant, Hallie, because at the time, the U.S. government couldn't really say what the capabilities of this Chinese spy balloon were, and they couldn't really say what it was able to collect. And even until now, that's not something they were wanting to talk about publicly, only saying that the U.S. government did the best to its ability in terms of trying to limit what it could assess. But now we are learning that the balloon was able to essentially pick up on electronic signals. So what that means is that when the balloon was traveling over an Air Force base in Montana, for instance, it could pick up some kind of communications either from a weapon system or from even just communications on the base. And because it was doing these figure eight formations, it means it went over some of these sensitive sites a couple of times. Right. So it's possible then it picked things up in a variety of different ways. But the U.S. continues to say that they don't believe that they got as much as they could have. But this is what the whole debate was about at the time in terms of shooting it out of the sky. And U.S. officials continue to say we didn't want to do that at the time because we didn't know how large the debris field could be or what kind of an impact it would have since it was so large. Large, and that's why they waited until it was over water to shoot it down. But the real issue here is just the fact that the balloon was actually transmitting this back to Beijing in real time. And the actual balloon also, according to this amazing reporting from Carol and Courtney, had a sort of self-destruct button that it could have been utilized. It's unclear why it wasn't or whether the Chinese tried to, and it failed. But clearly, it kept going on that cross-country journey. And now U.S. officials are working on the reconstruction construction part of it. And remember, they collected all of that debris out of the ocean. And now they're trying to see if they can glean more information, just as the Chinese were able to as they flew that over the United States. Hallie. Monica Alba, live for us outside the White House with that reporting. Thanks, Mon. Tonight, we are just hearing from the Virginia School Board in the city where an elementary school teacher was shot by her six-year-old student. That teacher just filing a $40 million lawsuit against the board and three former administrators. The board tells NBC News they haven't gotten the legal documents on this lawsuit yet, adding that the safety and well-being of our staff and students is our most important priority. It comes as attorneys for the teacher, Abigail Zwerner, tell our Savannah Guthrie in an exclusive interview that the shooting was a personal attack against Zwerner that could have been prevented. But they say the district blew off warnings and failed to stop the shooting from happening. Watch. I believe the facts will support the fact that they knew that they had three complaints, and then eventually a teacher comes down there and says, one of the students has actually seen the gun. At that point in time, you have a ticking time bomb in the school, and the school failed to do anything about it. NBC News has reached out to the three former school administrators and defendants in this case. We heard back from one of them with a no comment. I want to bring in Maggie Vespa here. And Maggie, what, what's also newsworthy about this lawsuit is some of what it reveals, what it claims about what led up to the shooting. Talk us through it. Yeah, Hallie, sort of the biggest revelation, as you say, is kind of some historical context tied to this specific student and what Abigail Zwerner and her attorneys allege that the school, the district, and top administrators named in this suit knew about this kid. In short, they say this six-year-old, the one who shot Abigail Zwerner inside her first grade classroom back in January, as they describe it, had a history of random violence. One such incident, they say, in the school year prior to the shooting, they say this six-year-old choked another teacher in the school and then was largely allowed to stay in school in the wake of that remain in the classroom. Then cut to the day of the shooting. Again, there were other examples besides that choking, but cut to the day of the shooting with this context, with this background knowledge, the shoot alleges that three staff members alerted top administrators at the school that this kid with this history had a gun on him. And again, not enough was done to stop what we now know played out inside that classroom. I want to give, with that context now, uh, one of the sound bites from this morning. I want to present this. This is yeah. what Abigail Warner's attorneys say they expect to hear from the defense in this lawsuit. We'll talk about it on the, on the other side. Take a listen. It's an assumption of the job that a four, first grade teacher is going to be shot by their own student, a six-year-old. Uh, that is unacceptable. That's outrageous. Um, and that's not what happened here. So in short, Zorna's attorneys say they expect what they describe as a workman's comp or a worker's comp defense in the state of Virginia, that to some degree, this is kind of an assumed risk as part of the job for a first grade teacher. Again, that's what they expect from the defense. We haven't heard that um, from any attorneys for any of the defendants named in this case. But yeah. one thing to look for moving forward, Hallie.
that sure will be potentially a part of where this legal fight goes. Maggie Vespa, live for us on that. Thank you very much. A new signal tonight that we may be in for another rough summer when it comes to gas prices, because the price of oil is skyrocketing today, with a surprise move by a big group of oil producers to cut how much they'll make by a million barrels a day. They say the cuts are, in their words, a precautionary measure, they say supposedly to help stabilize an oil market that's been kind of rocky. So now the price of crude is really going up. It's getting closer and closer to that $100 a barrel benchmark. That benchmark matters because it typically precedes a spike in prices at gas stations around the country. NBC's Brian Chung has more on this. Here we were last summer, right, paying record high prices for gas. That number has gone down. People felt good about that. But this is a new surprise. The Biden administration says they got some kind of a heads up about it. But what does it mean for all of us who drive uh, and as it starts to warm up and people hit the roads? Yeah, well, with these stories, it's always a reminder of supply and demand, right? If yeah. there's less gas being produced, then that makes the prices go up. And indeed, the decision by those members of OPEC to cut production by over a million dollars a barrel, a million barrels a day, will make prices go up, but only by about 5 to 15 cents. That's the estimate per gallon at the pump that's co that comes from gas buddy Patrick DeHaan, an analyst over there, saying that. But for historical context, we have to remember that in April 2022, the numbers that you're looking at your full screen, West Texas intermediate crude barrels are about $100 a pop. That's much more expensive than the $80 that we're seeing right now. And unleaded gas at that time was $4 a, uh, $4 a gallon compared to about $3.50 right now. So even if the price goes up by about 5 to 15 cents. That doesn't mean that we're going to see prices close to what we saw in the uh Recall around June, we were seeing five dollars a gallon nationally. Now that seems to be a much higher than where we would go as a result of these OPEC production cuts. But of course, there's a lot of other factors that go into there: demand, uh, the war in Ukraine. Those things could right. further exacerbate the prices. What options does the White House have here? Because you look at the countries that we're depend on for foreign oil. Many of them, most of them, are part of this OPEC plus alliance, right? So what what can the Biden administration do here to avoid some of the consequences potentially? Yeah, well, on one hand, we have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. That's something that the Department of Energy can actually lever. It's essentially about, they have right now, about 371 million barrels in the tank that they could release. You increase the supply by tapping that SPR, and you can get the prices down. But you also have to remember that what makes it so different now compared to the oil embargo of the 1970s is that the United States is a much larger producer now domestically. So you could pressure the U.S. producers here stateside to increase their output. Now, the Biden administration administration's success in doing that when the war in Ukraine happened last year was not so strong. But then one other thing that you could do as well is try to limit the exports of gas and diesel. This is something that the Department of Energy actually considered at the end of last year when they were worried about how cold this winter was going to get. They ultimately didn't do that. But this is all a reminder that the Biden administration has levers to do something about this if prices go too high, Allie. Brian Chung, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. When we come back, we are getting close to polls opening in what's being called the election of the year, 2023, of course. Why this election, why this race in one state could have a big impact on the whole country. Plus, why Leonardo DiCaprio was on the witness stand here in Washington today in court. That's coming up in The Five Things. We are just hours away from polls opening in Wisconsin in what's being called the most important election of the year, where voters will decide whether liberals or conservatives will control the state's Supreme Court. And if you're like, okay, well, I don't live in Wisconsin, why should I care? Well, the decisions that that court could make could have a ripple effect across the entire country. The court's been controlled by conservatives for years, but a right-leaning justice is set to retire, leaving a 3-3 split. So that means the race's more liberal candidate could flip the court's majority to her side. The election tomorrow is technically nonpartisan, but the candidates have been getting back up from state parties, liberal and conservative groups. The candidates, too, themselves are not hiding their political leanings in the dozens of ads on local TV right now. Listen. Dan Kelly doesn't believe that women should even have that freedom. On the Supreme Court, Dan Kelly will uphold the criminal ban on abortion. Janet Protosiewicz is a Milwaukee County judge with a long history of letting dangerous criminals back into our streets. NBC Shaq Brewster joins me now from Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, obviously, this is a big deal for people who live in the state where you are. But if you're in Texas or California or Florida or wherever, explain why you should care about this race, because there's a reason to. 
Yeah, Hallie, and you know, when you talk to liberals in this state, they say that it's about protecting democracy. That was an actual question I put to the campaign today. Janet Protosiewicz, Protosiewicz excuse me, has been uh, sick off the campaign trail, but she had an actual liberal justice on the Supreme Court in her place. Listen to her response when I asked, why should people from outside the state of Wisconsin care about this race? People outside of Wisconsin should care about this court race for a number of reasons. We are about a 50-50 state, yet we have a legislature that is 70% Republican right now. I think the nation looks at that and sees something that doesn't look very democratic. I think this election stands for a chance to, to stand up for democracy. And Hallie, they say that there are presidential level implications to this race. They point back to 2020 when former President Trump's attorneys tried to throw out some hundreds of thousands of ballots in Democratic areas, Milwaukee and Madison. At the time, you had three conservative justices on the state Supreme Court that sided with the former president's campaign. They argue that if Daniel Kelly, the conservative justice running for uh, the court right now, if he were on the court at the time, that would be a fourth justice to make the majority putting that election into question. So they're saying that it's not just about what happens here in Wisconsin, yeah. but it could have an impact on who wins the presidency at that national level. You are wearing, I know, your campaign reporter hat here or your campaign reporter half zip, talking with voters, with volunteers who are in this race. What are they saying? Why are they saying um, yeah. about wanting to turn out, getting people to turn out? Why is it important to them? Yeah, with the Supreme Court race, there are so many issues at stake. There's abortion, redistricting, the power of the governor, power of unions. But the issue that comes up the most, both in ads and conversations with voters, is the issue of abortion in this state where abortion is effectively banned based on an 1849 abortion ban that went into effect after the overturning of Roe. I want you to listen to some of the conversations with voters I had. The first voter who said that she usually doesn't vote in an election like this. I have a 19 year old daughter, so you know, who's in office, it matters for her future. Women's rights, is that what's driving you to the polls tomorrow? Yes, it is. Why? I, why? I don't want any man telling me what to do. I just had a couple of conversations with some conservative voters, and they said abortion, too. Protecting that ban on abortion in this state, protecting life, in their words, uh, is something that's driving them to the poll. So this is an election that usually we wouldn't be talking about, Hallie. Usually there wouldn't be that much attention on a spring election in an odd number uh, year. But a lot of people are focused on it because of that one issue, abortion, which we've been talking about since November, Hallie. I think you've laid it out well, Shaq Brewster. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the body of Stephen Smith has now been exhumed and autopsied, according to lawyers for his family. Smith's death in 2015 got a lot more attention during Alec Murdoch's murder trial, since Smith's body was found something like 15 miles from the Murdoch family property. Local law enforcement says they're investigating his death as a homicide. Number two, the meeting between Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the president of Taiwan is officially set. It'll happen Wednesday at the Reagan Presidential Library in California. China's not happy about it. Remember, Beijing claims Taiwan as its own territory and has already said a meeting like this would be a provocation, threatening to retaliate. Number three, Leonardo DiCaprio in a courtroom here in Washington, D.C. today, uh, testifying in a money laundering case against former Fuji star Praz Michel. What's the connection with DiCaprio here? He told jurors that his team did their best to vet Michel's co-defendant, who is a big financer of the movie The Wolf of Wall Street and who is accused of stealing billions of dollars in this case. Number four, McDonald's is shutting down its corporate offices until Wednesday to get ready to lay off hundreds of employees. It's part of a big plan corporate restructuring first announced in January. The CEO says it's not about cutting costs, but making sure they can innovate faster. Number five, the new Indiana Jones movie getting a pretty glitzy premiere at this year's Con Film Festival next month. It's called Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. The Dial of Destiny, the fifth and final chapter in that, what some people call beloved franchise. They're also gonna do a tribute to Harrison Ford and his career. That's cool. When we come back, the CDC says a deadly drug-resistant bacteria linked to contaminated eye drops is spreading. Why officials warn people are getting sick even if they don't use the eye drops in the first place. Stay with us.
The CDC today out with a new warning that a drug resistant bacteria that was first linked to some eye drops now seems to be spreading from person to person. They're saying they've identified these case patients who didn't remember or didn't use at all these artificial tears. We've told you before that this strain of bacteria is serious. This problem with these eye drops have been connected to 68 deadly infections, 68 infections rather across 16 states, infections that have been deadly in three cases. Three people died, eight people went blind, and four people had an eyeball removed. The eye drop company, Ezra Care, says it's cooperating with the CDC and the FDA. Dr. John Torres is joining us now. Dr. John, the concern now, right, is that this seems to be spreading from person to person, even if you didn't actually use the eye drops in the first place. And that is a concern, Hallie. And like they said, these are people who don't recall or did never, never use the eye drops. And so the concern here is this is a bacteria. We know bacteria can easily spread from person to person if we don't take pop, proper precautions. And we think that's what's happening here, especially for certain populations. We're talking about people with compromised immune system, people that might be in long-term type facilities, people who might have certain procedures done to them where they have indwelling catheters or other types of things in their body that could be putting, uh, basically letting the bacteria into their body. And once that happens, it can be very hard to treat because this bacteria, Pseudomonas originosa, which is a very bad bacteria, also has started to become drug resistant and very drug resistant, which means it's going to be harder to treat. And I think that's a result of what we're seeing here, Hallie. When you talk about the ways that they're trying to keep it from spreading then, like, right, what are the proper protocols for something like this? Because as a lay person, I would look at this and go, okay, don't use the eye drops. Like, okay, that clearly is not the solve here. And that's the first step is don't use the eye drops and make sure it's not in your house that you've gotten rid of it. CDC and the FDA are working together to try and make sure that it gets removed from the shelves and that people and doctors understand that they need to get rid of those eye drops. On top of that, they're sending out warnings to doctors saying, hey, spend extra time and take extra precautions to make sure your patients don't have this. And if they do, they are asking for help of the doctors to genetically profile this bacteria. In other words, to look at the genotype of this bacteria to help them do that so they can make sure it's all coming from a similar source and it's a similar bacteria. As we found out during the pandemic, these things can mutate into other forms. They're trying to make sure that this doesn't happen and they can figure out where exactly this is coming from and make sure that they stop it. This is the way they try to slow it down. So far, haven't been super successful at it, but hopefully as time goes on, we end up slowing this down and eliminating this completely, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, the American journalist detained in Russia is now appealing his arrest. And we've just learned in literally the last couple of seconds that he's received a visit now behind bars. What's being said about his condition and his mood right now? Plus, NASA naming the astronauts going on a really historic moon mission. In tonight's original, by that flight, has the space agency turning to AI for some extra help in missions to come. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. From Russia, police have arrested a woman who they say carried out a bombing at a cafe in St. Petersburg yesterday. One of the country's most well-known pro-war bloggers was killed in that explosion. At least 30 other people were hurt. Russian officials are blaming Ukraine, which denies any involvement. Instead, Kiev suggests domestic terrorism. Out of France, Parisians overwhelmingly voted to ban electric rental scooters in the city. You know, those little like scooters you see buzzing around all over the place. Districts which reported results so far said something like 85 to 90 percent of voters backed this ban. Last year, there were more than 450 accidents in Paris involving e-scooters or something similar. Three people actually died. Paris's mayor says the ban is set to start in September, although some e-scooter companies say they want to try to stop it. And in Israel, this ancient evil eye jewelry is going on display. Gold earrings, a hairpin, look at that pendant, some beads. Antiquities officials say the jewelry was found in a girl's coffin in the 70s that it's like 1,800 years old. We are just learning here in the last couple of minutes of the first visit by an independent monitor to that American journalist being held in Russia on spying charges, Evan Gershkovich. A human rights monitor has just spoken with him behind bars and says that Gershkovich, Gershkovich rather, is cheerful, cheerful and in good spirits.
with his lawyers officially his, appealing his arrest today. It's all coming as some European countries say they're planning to confront Russia at a UN Security Council meeting this week. It comes after a rare phone call between Secretary of State Tony Blinken and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in which the State Department says Blinken called for the Kremlin to let Gershkovich go immediately. The journal denies the spying charges against him. Lawmakers, in the meantime, are looking to show a united front against Russia with a visit to Ukraine today. Josh Letterman is joining us now. Let's start with this new information, Josh, about this human rights monitor who, who was able to go and to meet with uh, this detained American journalist who's behind bars. That's right, Hallie. And let's be clear, this isn't like an Amnesty International representative. This is Russia's equivalent of a human rights uh, monitor, the closest got thing that they it, have got it. to okay. that, who's okay. able to access people in prison. So, right, we should take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but it is encouraging well, Josh, that that's monitor a boulder who of him. salt. That's an important clarification here, because this is not an independent human rights monitor. This is a Russian saying, like, of course the Russians are going to say that. This is giving me deja vu from Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan here. Until somebody who right. is independent is able to meet somebody from the embassy, let's say. That hasn't happened yet with Gershkovich, right? Correct. And that is why it is so critical to the U.S. government that they get consular access to him, that they be able to have their own eyes and ears on what's happening with him. But at least we do have some specifics, according to this Russian uh, rights monitor who says that he is in a quarantine cell but does have access to a television, to a pair uh, of clean clothes, that he uh, has been in decent spirits and uh, that he is getting proper food, such as uh, porridge for breakfast. He had chicken and cabbage soup. Uh, for lunch, according to uh, this monitor. So a few details that at least uh, make clear some of the conditions that he's under, even as the U.S. wants to make sure they can verify that themselves. Um, talk through a little bit more about the, I mean, we mentioned the appeal that has been filed today. We mentioned what could come down at this U.N. Right. Security Council meeting. How do you see things unfolding over the next week as it seems like European nations and the U.S. are looking to up the pressure on Russia, especially after the phone call between Blinken and Lavrov? Well, it doesn't seem like there's any major breakthrough imminent. After that Lavrov Blinken phone call, it seems to be both sides just kind of tossing back the same accusations. And uh, at the Security Council uh, sessions that are coming up, you know, Russia is the rotating president uh, of the Security Council, meaning they're going to kind of dictate what the agenda is. But Russia already has a veto on the Security Council, meaning they can really block anything coming out of that body uh, that is critical of Russia. Uh, but it does seem like these other nations who are part of that group really want to use this moment as they are anticipating a new uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive uh, to really try to pu uh, push up the diplomatic, uh, military and economic pressure on Moscow. Before I let you go, Josh, we talk about the pressure on Russia, right? Talk more about this visit from, I believe it was um, the top Republican on the Intel Committee, right, that has traveled now to Ukraine, met with right. President Vladimir Zelensky in Kyiv. Uh, at the same time, I believe also today we had former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also in Ukraine. Well, this is good news for Ukrainians who have been worried about House Republicans, particularly those rank-and-file Republicans who have questioned continued U.S. military and economic assistance to Ukraine. But the real question is whether many of the weapons the U.S. has been sending Ukraine, those M1A1 Abrams tanks, are going to make it to Ukraine in time for them to use it in their counteroffensive, which uh, many experts expect to start really any day now, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Live for us from overseas. Lots to cover today. Appreciate it. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's NASA now naming the four astronauts it'll send to orbit the moon in the next Artemis mission. Three Americans, one Canadian. There they are. The big rollout taking the stage today. Jeremy Hansen, Victor Glover, Reed Wiseman, Christina Hammock-Cook. They're part of this ambitious push to establish a permanent base on the moon and to prep for a mission to Mars. But all of this activity means a new challenge, building rockets and spaceships and equipment fast enough to respond to obstacles out in space. So now NASA engineers are turning to AI to help design customized parts that are more advanced than ever. Tom Costello has the story. Here at the Goddard Space Flight Center outside of Washington, NASA research engineer Ryan McClelland is pioneering the use of artificial intelligence to design parts of the spacecraft of the future. In science fiction, there's always thousands of people living in space and these huge structures in space. And what I'm hoping this enables is 
us to get there. He calls them evolved structures. A lot of people comment that they look like alien bones, and it's no coincidence that they look like bones because they develop the same way that bones develop. The process starts with NASA leadership tapping McClellan's team to bring two components of a spacecraft together. The first thing is to get the requirements, you know, exactly what the part has to do. And then step two is to let the AI tool run and evolve over 30 to 40 iterations. And the next step is you make it with digital manufacturing. The new technology allows NASA engineers to shorten the time it takes to develop specialty parts for spacecraft from months down to just days. Plus, the parts are lighter, stronger, and they use less material than most human designs. This is a bracket for the Excite mission, which is a uh, balloon experiment that goes up above most of Earth's atmosphere and actually looks at exoplanet atmospheres. So this is just sort of a, a simple bracket that holds a optical assembly to the back of a telescope. Dr. Joe Hill Kettle leads NASA's engineering and technology directorate. The most important thing to me is this is the future of NASA and the future of, of space flight and the future of space instrumentation. She says the technology could be a vital resource for future missions. If we're going to have the sustained presence on, on the lunar surface or eventually on the Mars surface, that the additive machine creation of these parts and the and the rapid turnaround would allow those folks to be able to, to perhaps fix things in real time, be able to build things off planet. But McClellan says aspiring engineers shouldn't worry. This technology will not completely replace humans, at least not yet. Where it stands right now and where I see it in the near future is that it's kind of like a consultant that allows us to be more productive, but the human designers still need it. Artificial intelligence improving space flight one piece at a time. Tom Costello is joining us now live from Houston, where he's been covering the latest on the Artemis mission. So let's get back to that Artemis 2 and this announcement today. Talk through kind of this new generation of astronauts, what they're saying about the future here. Well, they're thrilled, as you could imagine. And this entire aircraft hangar today was filled with people who are absolutely thrilled. Other astronauts, astronauts' families, NASA staffers, politicians. But this is what's fascinating. These four astronauts, three Americans, one Canadian, are going to be headed to the moon. The last time humans walked on the moon, these people weren't even born yet. I mean, that really makes you feel, makes me feel old to realize that. But an astonishing group of people. You, I always feel like an underachiever around these folks. They are just unbelievably accomplished in their fields, accomplished in NASA. You've got Canadian fighter pilots, two American naval fighter pilots, an electrical engineer and Christina Cook, who is also uh, was a, a, a spacewalker with another woman, the first ever female only spacewalk. So a lot of accomplishment among all of these guys and their mission will take off, lift off in late 2024, they hope. And I'm sure you do as well. Tom Costello, thank you for that live for us in Houston. Appreciate it. Still to come. The big March Madness finale happens tonight. Whoever wins will make history. We're on the ground for the game and the one shining moment coming up. So in just the last couple of minutes, we've heard about the legit record-breaking numbers from the Women's National Championship basketball game. Nearly 10 million people tuned in to watch LSU break a tournament record with 102 points on Iowa for the Tigers' first ever championship. ESPN says this is the most watched women's basketball game ever, ever on record. Okay, tons of eyeballs, big deal. And that's going to make tonight's men's matchup pretty tough to beat. UConn versus San Diego State just a few hours from now. An all-time upset matchup. It is the first time since 2014 that neither team is a one, two, or three seed. So back in 2014, who won the last time that happened? Well, UConn. But the Huskies hoping to do it again to cap off one of the most dominant runs ever in this tournament. Their average margin of victory, nearly 21 points. It's the third biggest of all times as they look for their fifth national title. Sam Brock is in Houston. Let me just start it off, Sam, uh, with a bit of a brag, not for me, but for my team. Six of the top 10 in our network's March Madness pool are from this show team. They're a bunch of basketball baddies, but I got to say, not even they saw this final coming. Give us the vibe check in Houston. What's it like? Did you talk to folks from Connecticut, from, from the, the people who are out going to this thing? Talk us through it. 
So, so first of all, basketball baddies. I love that. I don't know who came up with that term, but it's amazing. And what do you mean, me, Sam? What do you mean? Allie Jackson, now ho team. <laughs> You probably came up. Um, let me just set the vibe for you right now. It is just phenomenal, right? I know, make no mistake about it, you talked about the history of having a four and a five seed with UConn and San Diego State, but UConn Hallie is a traditionally incredibly talented basketball program with a rich history. They've won four national titles. Were they to win this year, it would be five, tying them with Duke and Indiana for fourth most all time. And that team that you're looking on your screen right now is basically an NBA team playing against a bunch of Division I college schools. That's how talented they are multifaceted they have seven footers guards that can score an incredible upperclassman leadership Hallie we just interviewed the family of Andre Jackson Jr. he is one of their guards I talked a little bit about how close-knit they were growing up uh, I talked to his brother Marcus he said that Marcus told me you know they were thick as thieves growing up but that obviously Andre had more talent than anyone else as a football player he would take every single handoff and take it to the house for 70 yards and I would translate <laughs> that to a basketball court that's the kind of athletes we're talking about but they're from Amsterdam, New York, upstate New York, that entire town right now is going nuts. And it just makes you think about the impact that the schools and their success have on their communities. Yeah. How it brings people together, especially right now, is just so powerful to see, Allie. It's such a good point, Sam. And I, th I hope that people watch tonight, right, just for that, that part of it alone, even though we just laid out those gangbusters numbers for the women's game like it's it's tough to see and I, this isn't me speaking this is kind of experts and analysts who suggest it, it's unlikely the men are going to get that that many eyeballs necessarily because there's just not so many so-called blue blood schools like the big the dukes the north carolinas who are in this final Right, exactly. So last year you had Duke, North Carolina, and Kansas in the Final Four. That is not the same case this year. Obviously, there's a lot of national attention on this. But back to the women for a second. To give you some context for the figure that Please. you just cited, 9.9 .9 million people that watched the national championship game. When Iowa, Caitlin Clark, played Louisville a few days ago, they had 2.5 million. Okay, that's about a quarter of what you just cited. That was wow. higher than any number that ESPN had received. hear me i was asking sorry, Allie, photographer. I don't know if you can still hear me yes pan yeah, over so, can sorry, we see pan over for a second guys so they can see what we're talking about yep you yeah, actually there's a crew here Allie. it's going to be a little tricky he's going to try that's all right but you've got uh let me walk you through this you've got fans that are about to leave for the game they had a three Aww. buses that already were set off the players are coming out Allie, within the next hour as is the band they're going to be performing for them as they get onto the buses to go to nrg stadium so what you're talking about here i'm going to duck in this side hey guys it's me again uh is just really the atmosphere you can't replace this there's no facsimile like it in sports college basketball is amazing the families are all here, the friends are here, the support is incredible, and we just hope to see a good game tonight. But man, a lot on the line. You get the best assignment. Sam Brock, have fun tonight. Thank you. Thanks to your photographer as well for that quick thing. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.